I am here to talk about how games and AI drive innovation. And just to get this out of the way, I'm supposed to say I ran out of business cards. I just didn't have, bring any with me because my company is so new. So if you do need to get in touch with me, that's my contact information. And uh, just to get started, you know, right now we're hearing everywhere that robots are coming to take our jobs. And we see that everywhere in, in culture and in the news. So for example, there isn't a day that goes by that you don't see um, which sector is being influenced by, by this takeover of automation. So this, for example, is uh, a fast food restaurant in Nagasaki, Japan, and those are robot servers. And here, uh, the, the orange um, contraptions, are the robots, are called Kivas, and right now Amazon acquired Kiva for a steal of something like $180 million. And uh, those Kiva robots power a lot of the Amazon warehouses, replacing workers. When I first started researching Kiva and Amazon's collaboration, I think there were 50,000 robots, and I think they are at minimum doubling the number of robots in the warehouses every year. So I, last I looked, I think there were 100 or 150,000 Kiva robots now powering Amazon warehouses. So you can imagine the implications that's going to have in the workforce really in the next 5, 10, 15 years, even right now. And this, this is an example of one of the many charts that you see everywhere uh, that shows uh, which jobs are likely to be replaced through innovation, or um, through automation, excuse me, and innovation. And you know, one thing I really love to do is I, I just, I love to study the human trajectory of, of how we as a humanity create things and artifacts and technology and tools. And so the idea of an automated future has always been part of our DNA in one way or another. So this is a newfangled barber shop that was a, an illustration that was created in 1900 in France showing a kind of terrifying barbershop experience, if you ask me, uh, but this has always been part of our consciousness. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this contraption. Uh, obviously, it's a knight on the left-hand side, but the right-hand side is a model that was created by Leonardo da Vinci of a mechanical man. So I just think it's really fascinating that you know, we, we you know everything old is new again. And even if you go back even uh, thousands of years, one of the first times that uh, robots were mentioned in, was in mythology with uh, the creation or the, the, uh, of a talos, which is, uh, was in one story says that the god uh, Hephaestus, uh, the iron forger of the gods, granted, uh, gifted Crete, the island of Crete, Talos, to defend the island. And again, another example of mechanical man. That's a screenshot from uh, Harry Halsen film, Jason and the Argonauts, so one of my favorite um, animators and filmmakers. And, you know, and I think this crowd knows better than most that when we're talking about robotics and, and automation, we're also talking about artificial intelligence, right? And we see that Artificial intelligence, though, is a broad umbrella category, and it can be defined by a number of different ways, and artificial intelligence works different ways depending on what, what, what type you are uh, kind of creating. And I just want to um, give a caveat right here. I'm, I'm a dabbler as far as a programmer goes. I've been an entrepreneur and a founder, and I'm one of the few women who's raised investment capital, uh, so there you have it, there should be more. Uh, but I think it's important for everyone, whether you're a programmer, or a CTO, a designer, a product leader, an indie game developer, a publisher, to be a part and take part in the conversation of artificial intelligence, its uses and applications, but also its development. Because if you only have a single type of mindset or voice, um, uh, creating these tools and these methodologies and these algorithms, I think it could create potential problems for us down the line. So machine learning, I think everyone in this crowd probably knows that's one type of artificial intelligence, which is basically um, 
a type of, uh, of um, computing that does not require any kind of human in interaction. These are algorithms that are created and developed, and they, they learn input and gather input on their own and, um, and spit out output based on um, different situations and scenarios, and they do not require an organic living human being to touch that at all for it to function. So that's one type of machine learning. We see machine learning all the time in the game industry. Neural networks is another type of artificial intelligence that uh, game creators and other industries are using for all sorts of applications that we'll discuss later on. And neural networks, you know, at the simplest uh, level are, is when you are basically modeling, um, modeling uh, algorithms to mimic how the human brain works. We usually use it in the sense of gathering data sets. So if you have a, a game world, for example, and you gather all of the uh, chat logs from players and you use that to create a neural network that might uh, be a chatbot that interacts with the players or uh, you create a neural network to monitor uh, forums, for example. And this is one of my favorites. Another subcategory, and there are millions I could have chosen from subcategories and sub subcategories of artificial intelligence. This is artificial narrow intelligence. This is when this, the algorithm is really, um, is really designed to detect basically one type of input. And you can see how it can be challenging for a system um, to, dis to distinguish you know, what's a rolled up towel and what's an image of a pug. Right, and um, you know, a few months ago, I was in Australia uh, giving a keynote on a very similar topic, and I took a photo of um, what a marine animal called a dugong in New Zealand. And if you look up what a dugong is, D-U-G-O-N-G, I posted it on Facebook, and the the Facebook machine learning algorithm uh, classified it as as a pornographic image. So <laughs> it, it, it basically pinged all of my friends and said, is this image objectionable or is this an okay image? But it was a marine animal. But, you can, but when I look at the image of a dugong, and you ought to look it up after this talk or during this talk, you can see why a machine learning system might confuse a dugong with a whole variety of um, other things. And then, you know, the, the, the holy grail, right, is artificial general intelligence, right, where you have algorithms and AI that really responds to and interacts with the environment the way humans would, or maybe even surpasses us. And of course, that's an image from Westworld, everyone's favorite dystopian sci-fi program on HBO. Uh, you know, but... And, but, you know, it's not just AI that is exciting and, and games have been, always been the drivers of AI. It's combining AI with other new emerging, for, emerging forms of technology that I think is really exciting, sometimes high risk, high reward. Um, but if you think about the com combination of artificial intelligence, machine learning with things like augmented reality, like we've seen a lot of... Um, We've seen a lot of discussion lately about how augmented reality is going to change the retail shopping experience. So imagine um, a sophisticated adaptive AI that knows me, the user, and I'm going into a retail store, for example, or I'm a doctor and I'm going to see a patient and I need just-in-time information. And you know, depending on where I am and where I'm using this, this combination of, of innovative technologies, I am being directed to certain locations. Uh, it knows me and is learning about me and my preferences. My attention is being um, uh, put somewhere. In the case of the medical example I just used, you know, doctors could uh, potentially uh, call up relevant information. And this is where I think it gets very exciting. And when I'm talking about relevant information, I'm talking about um, a lot of the medical field is exploring the use of AR in, in their treatment programs. That's something else I've done a lot of work on is I've done a lot of work with uh, NIH-funded projects that involve some of these elements. And, uh, and, you know, a lot of buzz right now around the blockchain system. So imagine using blockchain technology and then combining that with even some basic elements of machine learning 
or um, if it's a, appropriate, a, a neural network, and then think about what innovative creations you can make if you're combining those, those things. And then, of course, voice control. I think uh, I've, I know that when I use SMS, for example, uh, or text somebody, I'm almost always using my voice to send a text. And walking around this conference today, I've noticed just about everyone else is doing that too. And I think that um, technology uh, and product creators have been surprised about how quickly voice has been adopted by the population. I only need to mention Amazon Echo as one example. But imagine adapting voice control and voice um, input technology with artificial intelligence. And imagine what we can do in the world of games when we're doing that. So obviously, it's an understatement to say that we're seeing all kinds of uses of applications for AI and machine learning everywhere. And I'm sure everyone in this room, you're familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, is, uh, right? I'm sure you've all seen that. And if not, every year, Gartner comes out with a hype cycle. And you can see it's kind of a, a sort of a bell curve, but it's, you know, where they will identify technologies that are sort of emerging then they'll talk about te technologies or products or, or services that have, you know, everyone's talking about it. I would say um, my impression is VR is probably at the, at the top of the hype. Is that, so VR was at the top of the hype cycle about a year ago. I think it's in the, the trowel of disillusionment now, so for example. But if you look at every single one of these elements, whether it's uh, quantum computing or smart dust, or uh, any of these other things, virtual reality, um, you can see that you can see that they use some element of AI. And I and since this is a game video game game specific audience, I would also suggest that just about every sector that's mentioned on this hype cycle, uh, in one way or another, will involve some kind of game element, game mechanic, game element. So one of my, the reasons that I was really excited to be able to do this talk for the audience today is to just encourage all of us to really explore uh, how to enter into other sectors and how to leverage the know-how we've developed in the game industry, which right now is, I think, going through some painful transitions for folks, and uh, to just see how it's possible to do what we do in this sector in partnership with other sectors. I mentioned the medical field. I've done a lot of work with um, scientists and neuroscientists using what I've done in the game industry since the beginning of my career. And I think it would do well for this industry to expand in those areas. Um, one of the reasons my former company, Playmatics, was able to survive all of the ups and downs of you know, mobile first, mobile last, social games, now not social games, is because we diversified immediately and it was a lot of hard work, uh, but you'll find that the, it's more of a blue ocean there than I think a lot of what, have, what, what we've been experiencing in the, the casual and core, mid-core gaming worlds, with some exceptions. So I'm gonna talk about the fact that we all know here in this, in this audience that games using AI is nothing new. We've, we've innovated, and that's something I've always been fascinated about is the fact that our industry, are all, we're, we're always on the cutting edge of innovation, and we always are sort of a testing ground for um, these kinds of advancements that get deployed in other industries. And so, um, so when I speak to a sort of non-gaming audience, I give them a general definition of games. There are many that you can, that you can um, provide folks, but I try to tell people, why is that the case? Well, it's because games obviously provide a constructed context for play and exploration, and then I give folks a definition. I mean, we, there are a million definitions for what a game is, but I think it's really good to set that context because we all are gamers in one way or another, and throughout the history of humanity, we have been, but uh, if we really think about what a game is, it's essentially a sandbox, right? Uh, and then, uh, and the sandbox allows you to test out all different kinds of uh, pacing, flow, interactions, messaging, and things like that. And then, of course, <laughs> Richard Bartle will probably uh, hate the fact that I'm using his player styles as an example because I think he thinks it gets overused and, and, and abused. But you know, uh, 
there are all sorts of ways we can extrapolate uh, game design and, 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 and game elements based on how we think our players are going to interact with, with the, um, the creation we're making. And so I was really lucky. I was involved in the world of AI-driven games pretty early on, and I think at a pretty sophisticated, wonderful place. My first job in tech was at a place called PF Magic. You had to work there for a year before they would tell you what the PF stood for. But we created the first ever virtual pets products. And we, I worked with a guy named um, Andrew Stern, and I also, who's still around and doing great work today, and I also worked with Ben Resner, who's at the MIT Media Lab. And we created, I mean, if you look at CryptoKitties, CryptoKitties is basically pets uh, without the crypto. <laughs> and, um, and then also at that time, uh, my PF Magic was acquired, and so I also had an opportunity to work with creatures. And I know these are early game examples, but what I think is interesting about creatures versus pets, I would wager pets, which by the way, Ubisoft owns to this day and I, um, has made many iterations of it. Pets was not, there, we had very sophisticated behavioral programmers and folks who, who studied and knew about AI um, driven um, you know, pets in this case, but we erred on the side of, of Entertain, being entertaining, creating characters. We always said we were the Disney of pets, <laughs> basically. Whereas creatures, uh, they took a much more scientific approach. They were very um, hardcore, as far as I saw it, in terms of how they um, made and created their pets. And I would say, while creatures was more correct, for example, in terms of their breeding algorithms and all of that, I would say pets was more entertaining and ultimately much more successful. So I would suggest that when we're leveraging AI in games, it's really a combination of art and science. And that's why I think making video games is so difficult because, because you know, I'm sometimes jealous of my friends who, who just work in the app economy and they're making a, a shopping app or what have you. Because while they're difficult to make, it's, it's not the same challenges that we as game creators make. We are dealing with so many different elements, and I think what we do really is for the, co the combination of the best of what art and technology have to offer. And that's why games have always been innovative, even if we do get short shifts sometimes. And, uh, and you know, we've seen NPCs evolve, right? You know, to, from being just these dumb, sort of pre-scripted, um, things we encounter in games to either help us along the way or challenge us. And then we've seen them kind of grow and evolve. And this is a, a game called Red Shirt by, that, that, that was designed by Emily Short. She works with a company called Spirit AI right now. She's one of the founders, I just discovered. Uh, and we're seeing the evolution of much more intelligent NPCs, right? So why is that important? You know, we've all seen studies, you know, I used to teach a class at Parsons on MMO and Warcraft and all that, and there were all these social science studies where it showed that when a player is interacting with an NPC, even if it's the dumbest NPC in the world, they will often transfer real world qualities or human qualities that to that, to that NPC as though it's a real person. And, you know, going back to pets, I can't tell you, you know, we had an online community of a million players who swore that their pets were unique to them and that they trained their pets to do uh, really special things. So, um, so this is sort of uh, really important because when we see that on Twitter, you know, two thirds, half, 25%, who knows, of Twitter is compri comprised of scripted and adaptive bots and people think they're real. I mean, when I see a politician arguing with a Twitter bot, um, you know, this has real world implications, and where did it all start? It started in the video game industry, right? You know, uh, half of the president's um, Twitter followers are bots, but we as a population have the perception that he has a mass following, mass following of bots, potentially, on Twitter. And then, you know, there's the whole issue of um, the importance of, of, of representative data sets. Because if you don't have a representative data set for your AI, then you're getting into a situation like we had at Facebook, and we still have, 
where you're just, you're in an echo chamber, where you're being fed news stories that really have no, you know, no real world weight oftentimes, and it's just based on your, your friends and your immediate associations. And so I think things like algorithmic uh, accountability and transparency are issues that all of us in the industry are gonna have to deal with in one way or another. And then, you know, this is a, a screenshot from Mr. Robot, uh, where one of the characters is interacting with Alexa and says, Alexa, are you happy? So there she's, she's immediately emoting, and I think that's very t much going to be what our world is now and what, what will be coming. And then we're seeing multiple innovations. Here's uh, Cosmo by Anki. I don't know if you're familiar with this company. It's one of my favorite companies. And this is a little robot character you can buy now on Amazon. And Anki, you can play games with Anki, and Anki will adapt and learn to, un, to interact with you based on your personality. And, you know, but early forms of AI have always been in existence, right? So tic-tac-toe is an AI-driven game. You're calculating all of the moves possible. And then it goes on, and then we have adaptive gameplay. And imagine where we're going to be taking adaptive gameplay when we're not having to program this stuff necessarily from scratch. There are a lot of these, these middleware folks out there who will have tools that might allow us to enter the marketplace a lot sooner, or you don't have to have a degree in AI to, um, to make some of this innovative content. Another traditional way that game creators have used AI is in field of vision triggers. And this is um, one of Andrew Stern, my, my former colleague's first forays into natural language processing with a game called uh, Legacy. That's from a few years ago. And, uh, and we've seen QuickDraw come out by Google, um, where they basically developed a neural network based on all of these people um, drawing a, a certain given image. And Google has open sourced that drawing, so anyone here can access those. Last count, there were over 50 million drawings. Now, talk about, talk about data sets, right? Representative data sets. And we'll see Google do this again recently with the, is your, portrait in a, is your portrait in a museum? And again, Google is doing this to, to really uh, refine their machine learning algorithms through a fun little toy like that. Now imagine what we as, as innovators can do in the game industry if we thought about features in this way as well. And again, it's not just Google. Uh, there's NVIDIA, there's Spirit AI, IBM Watson, just to name a few of, of um, creator, technology creators who are out there and want to work with people like us. I mean, the list is endless. Uh, imagine collecting thousands of years or hundreds of years or decades of Go moves in a neural network. Well, that's what this is trying to do, AlphaGo Zero AI. By the way, Go is really difficult. Another way that, uh, for me, <laughs> another way that AI is used is in, uh, I mentioned chatbots, text data extraction, language processing, user segmentation. And then, um, you know, just in terms of gameplay, here's a, an innovative game called Quest a Game. It's basically the Shazam of, the, of nature. So if you are given uh, challenges to, you know, find a butterfly or, a, or in my case in San Francisco, a crow, since there are millions of them, or parrots. Uh, but then there's a whole design element, because if I'm a new user of the, sh the Shazam for nature, the, the, the uh, system, the algorithms are going to need to know my location. They're going to need to give me quests that are easy to to do. So my first quest with Quest a Game, when I loaded it up, and I'm a fan of the game, was actually something that was a little hard for me to find. I think it was like a hummingbird or something. A little bit difficult. So, so it, again, it's art and science. It's not just having the, the know-how, but, but it's having that sensitivity. And then, of course, in marketing, uh, all sorts of applications. And then, of course, cautionary tales abound. Cautionary tales abound. Uh, this is a, I don't know if you're familiar with this AI study that was released uh, by Stanford, but they claim to be able to predict a person's sexuality based on their facial features. And it was quite controversial. And, you know, folks were saying, well, is it really, uh, is it really a reflection of accurate results or is it a reflection of certain biases that were built into the algorithms to begin with? I don't know, I don't have that answer. And if, uh, 
My year in games, my, my year in Facebook, here's another one. This is one I, I beat them up a lot about this a few years ago. You got, this is my year in review. And people were being served up images of their um, deceased relatives, their house that you know, burned to the ground. And again, just because you can do something with machine learning doesn't mean you ought to. And you ought to really test this with a representative group because I, I can imagine how horrifying it is to uh, be painfully reminded of a, of a child who passed away through a Facebook um, uh, image surrounded by tacky clip art. And again, um, the Facebook like, hate, dislike, love, all of that is going into a giant neural network, right? So it, you know, we're basically the product of Facebook in a lot of ways. The who were you in the past life, the Facebook quizzes generally don't do them. But again, they're all using machine learning um, to figure stuff out. And I would just say <laughs> Elon Musk, he's always good for, the, for the, uh, you know, the conclusion, the finale. I mean, as game creators and people who've been on the cutting edge of, of what AI can do, uh, and, and, and as people who see what we do spill out into all other sectors of, of society and the world, we really have to take the lead in terms of uh, using AI consciously, responsibly, creatively, and in terms of a representative way. So it's always a balance. Um, study these, the hype cycle. I think you'll be amazed how much games really interact with all of these different sectors. And that's it. So thanks for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show.